Well, hello there and welcome. I'm Susan Smith. You're in my studio, Stitched by Susan. And today we're going to be quilting freehand. So yeah, welcome, welcome. This is the last live and unscripted session of 2021. So it's going to be a good one. Um, I'm going to be working on a Christmas quilt so that I'm ahead for next year. It's kind of what I'm thinking here. And it happens to be my own quilt. So that's kind of extra fun for me today. I got to make whatever decision I wanted to make. It's all good. So yes, we will be quilting an edge to edge design on this. I will be quilting. You'll be watching and chiming in. A um, few topics today. I'm going to talk a little bit about my thread color choice. Um, and I'm also going to talk about design development. So if you're interested in working through your own edge to edge designs, I'm going to talk a little bit about my thought processes while I was doing that, you know, transitions or spacing or scale and those sorts of things. So a little extra information today beyond just the mechanics of quilting. So hang around for that. I hope everyone's had a great Christmas and is having a semi relaxing week between the two big holidays. I know I've talked to a lot of other quilters often on this week who are finding a little bit of time in a little bit of lull, you know, when things are a bit, you know, work is usually not as, as rapid, um, finding time to do some sewing or some projects for themselves. So that's good. And I've been doing the same thing. I'm working on piecing a quilt for our guest room bed and it's huge. It's queen size. So I kind of took this week to spread it out on my studio floor. It's kind of over there on the edge. I had to fold it up a bit for today, but to, to just spread it out, get the layout in place and start putting it all together. So, you know, that's kind of a bigger project and I don't always get hours end to end to sew together. So that's one of the things I'm doing this week. I'd love to hear what you're working on. And I thought I might just mention, cause this is always candid, right? I'm going to change up the format just a hair of these episodes. So we're going to open with this kind of casual conversation. Feel free to chat about what you're working on and I will about mine. And when we upload this to YouTube after the live is over, this first part will come off. And so even your comments will that happen during this first little segment. So I'm just doing it to give people time to join because it always takes a few minutes for people to, to log in and find me and things like that. So it's just an extra time that we can just chat about anything we want to, stories from our week. So I would love to hear what you're working on in your studios this week. And Dave will give me some comments. Lauren, excited for the broadcast. I'm sure you will end with the big fireworks of a design. Well, you know, close. It does have something to do with lights. <laughs> praying that 2022 brings peace to all and lots of finished quilts happy new year to one and all thanks lauren and pat happy new year from vermont i'm wondering what the weather's like in vermont we have gotten quite a lot of snow in the last 10 days and it is a wintry world here in the inland northwest Lori, happy new year from yakima washington that's not too too far from me happy new year from delaware that's a long ways from me <laughs> and judy hello from georgia and happy new year and Teresa, my first time catching live. Welcome, Teresa. So glad you're here. This is going to be fun. Linda England, Happy New Year, Dave and Susan. Well, we sure appreciate all these well wishes. Sherry, hello from Medford, Oregon. Squeezing in the binding for one more finish before the end of the year. Great. You have one more box you can tick in your, in your quilt planner. <laughs> that's great. Is that all the names we've got, Dave? Yep. That's, that's it so far? Okay. Um, yeah. One of you is working on binding. I see there's a little sunny corner in my quilt. This is another process when we're producing these videos is we try to use natural light because it shows up the quilting the best in the room. But as winter has progressed, that light keeps changing, you know, the, whether the sun is higher or lower and all those things. And so, yeah, you're seeing a really sunny corner, aren't you, right here? And that will probably change over the next half hour. So Wendy is tuning in from Ohio via Florida. Nice. So I assume you are holidaying with family. There, Dave pulled the blinds a little bit. Sorry about the funny wobble. Uh, Lori, we have no snow here in Yakima. It's very unusual. Oh, no kidding, because I'm not that far from you and we've got, I don't know, eight or 10 inches. Pat, not much snow, but more freezing rain. Oh, that's unpleasant. Hope you have your warm cuppa, something. Karen, happy new year and may 2022 be wonderful for you all. Karen from South Africa, lovely rain tonight. How nice. PJ from Missoula, Montana. Oh, Pam. There we go. Pam is your name. I'll try and remember that. 
Teresa, I'm loading up a quilt for my son, finally able to long arm one of my own. Great. And that's another thing I'm actually hearing from um, a few quilters is that they kind of reserve this week of time when everyone's done their crazy Christmas projects, you know, that crazy November and December busy is over. And they take some of this time um, in late December and early January to do their own quilt. So that's a great idea. And honestly, because quilting is a business for me, I kind of purposely take time to plan some of my quilts in and I do it throughout the year because it's so rewarding, but I do it also at this season of the year when I know there's going to be a bit of a lull in client work. This is a great time to finish some of my projects and it feels so good and it just sets me up for the coming year. Diane, good morning from snowy East Wenatchee. That's not too far from me too. Great, great. So glad to have you all tuning in. Okay. Let's, let's kind of get down to business. Once again, for those who are just chiming in, um, I'm Susan Smith. You're in my studio, Stitched by Susan. And these live and unscripted episodes are irregular for me on YouTube. They are always the first and the third Friday of every month. And today you're getting a happy bonus because I was away seeing a grandbaby on the first Friday of December. So today's kind of an extra. Next Friday is again the first Friday of the month. So we will be back next Friday with another project. Most times I am quilting edge to edge and freehand an entire project. My purpose for these episodes is to just invite you to watch whatever I'm doing in my studio. So it's not a class per se, but as I'm working on the project in hand, I will talk about decisions, choices, whys and wherefores, you know, maybe my favorite tools, whatever happens to apply to the project I'm working on. So if you're newer to long arming, and maybe even if you've been doing it for a while, I think that you'll find these really helpful because, you know, when you are a long armor, you can't easily go and work alongside your friend, right? You can't have a, have a quilting bee and take your long arm with you. So this is just a chance for you to see in my studio how I do things. There are other ways to do things. I don't claim to know everything or that this is the right way to do things. It's just how I do it. So I kind of give my reasons and you can take what is helpful and take it into your own studio. So today I am working on an edge to edge design. It's called filaments and it is newer to me. I think I've only quilted it on two projects so far. And um, a week or 10 days or so ago, I had posted some reels on Instagram and Facebook that kind of showed it in process. So maybe you saw those. That's the design I'll be quilting today. And I thought I would spend a wee bit of time um, talking about kind of my thought process as I'm working my way into a new design. So sometimes it's where the idea comes from, but often the first time or two or five that I quilt it, I'm still working out, you know, how to transition kind of the sequence of my movements across the quilt to make it easier, to make it look more graceful. So I thought I would kind of just talk as I quilt about some of those thought processes, because after all, this is the goal of doing edge to edge work freehand is that the sky is the limit. You can always be inventing, developing, working up, finding inspiration for new designs. And so you want to be able to think through them. How do I make this a continuous line design that I can quilt? What do I need to change to make it quilt a bowl? And I've talked in other um, formats, some of my challenges and things like that about places where I find inspiration, hotel carpets. Uh, wallpaper, obviously fabric is a common one, um, wainscoting, woodwork in buildings, all kinds of things provide inspiration, but sometimes they have to be tweaked and converted a little bit to be quiltable. So I'll talk a bit about that today. I'm working on my long arm Lucy. You can see Gamel loud and clear. Now you know what brand I use. Um, Lucy has a 26 inch throat, so lots of clearance. I like that because it means fewer passes of my quilt. If you enjoy this episode today and find it helpful, I would love if you would hit the like and the subscribe button. And even if you ting on the little bell, then you will get notifications whenever I do go live. Um, we do upload these to YouTube, so they're accessible forever. But if you're here while I'm live, you can actually ask questions in the comments and I'll respond during the course of the quilting process. So that can be really helpful for you if you do have questions about what I'm doing. Also, you see I have in my hand my, my fresh morning cup of coffee. You guys know that I love coffee. So if you're interested in supporting this broadcast, you can go to buymeacoffee.com forward slash stitched by Susan. And I think Dave's put all the links 
in the comments for you and there for as little as five dollars you can do a one-time donation or if you wish you can join the coffee and cream subscription which is five dollars a month so all that goes toward just increasingly developing our equipment levels um, the camera that's going to be doing the close-up work on the quilting today is one that we recently purchased and we did that all with our buy me a coffee money so thank you to all of you who support we try to use it as wisely as we can another place that you can find me is i have a podcast called measure twice cut once and other life lessons learned from quilters so that is usually interview style in which i bring a guest on and we talk about um, usually their quilting experience but yesterday for example I interviewed a weaver and so there's some different crafts that are represented there and it's just very casual conversation about what um, these crafters what their craft has meant to them maybe where they learned it um, and some life lessons they've learned from it so an informal but um, easy listening podcast measure twice cut once and yeah I think that about covers the intro so are we ready to get started Dave, Mr. Producer, sir, here's a good moment to give a couple credits, by the way. My husband is behind the camera and monitors and hard drives and a bajillion wires. So thanks to Dave for doing, there's his finger <laughs> right in front of the camera. Thanks to Dave very much for doing all that heavy lifting to make this possible. This is definitely not a one woman show. And also the music that you hear throughout the broadcast is our good friend, Dan. Um, playing his guitar and he graciously allows us to use his music so we appreciate that thanks Dan okay let's get quilting one sip of coffee so I have already loaded my quilt today because it is a bit bigger one than I sometimes do and I wanted to save a bit of time so in other episodes I go more in depth in my loading of the red snapper system so just briefly today i've loaded my backing i've chosen today to put my quilt right side up so it's narrowest this way just for the purposes of the camera often if i have the option i will load my quilt this away so that the longest side goes from end to end because that means fewer passes advancing my quilt so that there's not a right or a wrong there's reasons for and against but today for camera angles i loaded it top of the quilt is at the top of the frame I have already put on my batting I'm using Hobbs 80 20 so it's 80 percent cotton 20 percent poly they also have an 80 20 that is 80 percent wool but this is the cotton and poly um, this is my favorite all-purpose batting it's very economical as to price it has a nice level of loft not too fluffy not too flat it's very washable and durable and so very it's the right choice in my opinion for a quilt that's going to get used and handled and may be washed some number of times throughout its life so Hobbs 8020 is loaded and this is my quilt this pattern is called home for the holidays and it's by Vanessa Christensen of V and Co and the the um, background fabric is an Essex linen it's kind of a mottled um, black and gray and all the trees and all the piecing is Vanessa Christensen's fabrics as well I bet a lot of you are familiar with her ombres so this is the confetti ombre it's got the little gold polka dots on it I if you have not met her ombre fabrics I encourage you to do so they are so beautiful these trees for example are done with I believe there's two colors of green in the quilt but all this variety of shades just comes from the fact that it's ombre so it just gives a quilt so much depth of color and almost sparkle although there's not really very many different fabrics so I love it and I debated let me get back on camera I debated quite honestly whether to do this custom quilting this project or edge to edge quilting and I know a lot of people would have looked at this and said that's got to be custom you've got to play up the trees and the stars and so forth and I thought you know this is a really great chance to show my watchers why I love edge to edge so much I don't think it detracts at all from the beauty of the piecing and I think that just by laying a texture over the whole quilt it's going to be absolutely beautiful and when I'm sitting here weighing okay do I want to spend 10 or 12 hours or more custom quilting it or do I want to spend two or three perhaps edge to edge quilting it that's a no-brainer for me this is a quilt that's going to get used on our couch I want it to be serviceable I want people to not feel nervous about handling it and using it so you give me your opinion as the show goes on 
do you think that this edge to edge design is playing up the beauty or do you think it really was worthy of a custom? But I wanted to show you my train of thought. And one last thing, thread choices. I, okay, we'll move a little closer so you can see. Do you want the close up camera, Dave? Okay, here we go. So I have a charcoal gray and I'm using Isocord 100% polyester thread in a 40 weight. That's my most common quilting thread, probably 99% of my quilting. So it is, it doesn't have a name, it has a number, 0112, but it's a charcoal. And the, the background, as I've said, is this kind of um, linen look woven and the gray just kind of is a middle of the road color for that. What's different today is I, oh, I'm having a hard time under the camera. There we go. I've chosen a lighter shade of gray for the bobbin thread. And that's because I've got this bright kind of mixture of pinks and reds really on the back, the backing. You'll see it in some of the other shots better. Um, actually, I can move over. There we go. It's these very organic waves. One of my friends picked this backing for me and I, and I hope it's the right choice. <laughs> it certainly is a bright one. Anyway, I didn't want the, um, bobbin thread to be terribly, terribly dark on all that pink. So I went one shade lighter with my bobbin thread. So that was my thinking there. I've already started basting the quilt, but then I stopped because I thought you guys are going to want to see this. That's the whole point of this process is to see it being done. So let's get back to basting. My Lucy has a channel lock. You maybe heard that little click. It's just um, magnetic and it allows me to make a perfectly straight line across the top of the quilt. So I'm just going slowly and with my fingers, making sure that my seam allowances are laying down underneath. And that straight channel lock ensures that I've got a perfectly straight line. And so as I need to, I can actually adjust the top of the quilt to make sure that it's perfectly straight. Some quilters run a horizontal line like this through just the batting and the backing and then line up their quilt against it. That is certainly an option but it's one more line of stitching that you have to make. So I find this works for me. And I'm just manipulating the quilt just a little as I go to make sure it's smooth and flat and it's all getting eased in there. This quilt is fairly flat, so I don't have any um, massive excess or anything to deal with. This linen, which you'll see as we work, frays quite badly and so that's kind of one of the things I have to work with on this quilt is, is dealing with all these little stray threads. Are you seeing here that I'm, um, again with my fingers, kind of manipulating? If I were to just run my machine down the front at every one of these seams, it would be pushing forward a little bit. So I'm making sure that those seams go under without being stretched downwards. If you're not comfortable doing that with your fingertips, Put some pins in those seams before you sew. But you need something to ensure that the edge of your quilt does not get pushed downwards as you're basting. I use all kinds of visual cues to make sure that that is, you know, working out smoothly. But the main one is looking at my seams relative to the bars of my machine, right? So I'm making sure that my seams run straight and they don't curl up into a smile at the edge or go downwards into a frown. So just always um, kind of step back and look at that big picture and always be checking those sorts of things. And I give a nice tug to the central area of my quilt to make sure everything is smooth. Gosh, let me make this better so you can see. Take all my channel locks off. There we go. I just want to make sure that this is smoothed out, that there's no hump here against my stitching line. So all the fabric is pulled nice and snug and I'm floating my top, which means both the quilt and the batting. Can you see those? Yep. They're just hanging down in front of me. What I'm going to do to ensure that they stay in place is use my trusty magnetic bars. I should have Lucy on the other side. You guys can't see what I'm doing here. Hang on a sec. Way you go, Lucy. Okay, magnetic bars. These are just from the hardware store and they're the type that you would use for hanging knives in your kitchen or tools in your shop. And I just apply those along the front rail of my machine. And that ensures that this stays straight. Otherwise, when I quilt in here, this would gradually be pulling up. 
my basted edges would stay straight and the middle would be pulling up. I don't want that to happen. So once I put these bars in place, I'm going to do one longer one. Once I put the bars in place, my quilt is now stable, all four sides. I've got basting on three sides and I've got my magnetic bars on the fourth. So this whole work surface area now is fixed. It's not going anywhere. Mr. Producer put a link in the comments for those bars. Um, I think it's probably to my resource page on my website and there's a link there for the bars that I like and some of my other favorite tools. But let's get started quilting. One last thing is to put um, stretchers, for lack of a better word, on the edges of the quilt. The ones that I'm using are also the Red Snapper brand. I'm not necessarily brand specific in my preferences, but what I like about these is that they're very long. Because I have a 26 inch throat, I like my stretchers for the side. Dave's asking me to show it. Here it is. So this is the part that my quilt there we go. There's a little s groove here that the edge of my backing fits into and it snaps shut with little rubber grippers that hold and then I put tension on this. The, the beauty of it is that it's long so I get even tension you know on my whole quilted working area as opposed to um, what my machine came with which is just one clamp here and one clamp here. So when I put these on though I'm careful not to put I don't want a drum, so I'm careful not to put a ton of tension on this. I just want it snug enough that it can't ripple up anywhere. So if I put my hand under here, I can actually grab my fingers. This is not drum tight. It looks super smooth to you because of camera angles, but it is not drum tight. It's just taut. And we're ready to quilt. This is a super, super, super easy design. It's just comprised of L's and an echo. Most often I do them in groups of two or three, but because it is freehand, um, can be more, can be less, depending on whatever fits. So I'm going to quilt a little while to get back in the groove of this because I haven't quilted it in 10 days or so. And then I'll talk a little more about my design process, which I promised you. Sometimes I have to pause and think where I'm going. Now, did you sharp-eyed quilters notice that I actually made one set sort of upside down? Did you also notice that I'm not changing it? <laughs> and basically the reason I'm not is the texture is still going to overall look the same. So I think that it's perfectly satisfactory. And another thing that I'm watching out for just a little bit on this quilt specifically is that some of these seam allowances are quite thick, in the points of these geese. So I'm going slowly because again, I want to be sure that my hopper foot does not push them and make a funny, you know, bump anywhere. If your machine has a spoon foot, that would certainly be an option for this. I've opted not to use it for the sake of visibility. I want to see where I'm driving a little better and my spoon foot is not see-through. So that's just a decision you have to make, but the spoon foot certainly would help with keeping the seams flat. So if your spoon foot is see-through, that would certainly be a consideration. So the first couple of times that I quilted this, the first yard or two that I was quilting, 
it was a bit of a puzzle to determine which direction to go with my L's. And I still sometimes find myself a bit discombobulated like that early one that you saw and have to rethink it and kind of, kind of cover up my boo-boo. But for the most part, I'm launching into each section of filaments in the opposite direction that I'm heading because I'm going to echo back. So it's a really good idea to practice something like this on paper a few times before you start quilting or on a practice piece of fabric. If you're like me and your head just thinks better with thread than with doodling and paper, just to get that thread path established. And some designs I just find are like that. Ribbon candy is another one that kind of messes with my head in terms of where am I going next? So I find that I have to doodle it to establish a bit of muscle memory, whether I'm doodling on paper or on, you know, a practice um, piece. So I encourage you to do that if you need to. So you get used to, you know, if I go into L's this direction, here's where I'm gonna end up. And if I want to go in a different direction, I need to start differently. Does that make sense? And in terms of scale, certainly this would be an easier, an easy one to do, you know, either larger or smaller. What I was looking for was for my echoes to be about the same size as my loops, so that when the whole thing is done, I have this pretty even texture. And I would say mine is about, it's less than half an inch, more than a quarter. So that's about how wide my loops are and that's about how far away I'm echoing. I like the look that that produces. So like I said, you could easily change the scale of this and make everything larger, but I'll give you one caution. The bigger you make a design, the harder it is to fit in the corners, to not have big open spaces that are awkward to fill. So that was kind of my guiding factor for what size I'm going to make this. But I think you could very easily bump it up to say half an inch. But if you started making inch wide loops and inch sized echoes, it might be difficult to, um, you know, know where to go next and to not have any awkward spaces. That said, when I find myself needing to move into an area that hasn't been covered yet, it's very easy to just echo in a similar size to what I've been quilting and just travel along to the next area where I want to go. An echo is a wonderful thing.
back. And echo ahead. So maybe that'll make it a little easier for you the first time you try it. And this time, because I'm wanting to turn a corner and start going the other way, I'm not going to echo way out ahead. I'm just going to tuck a little one right in here. There we go. And now I've started at the end, looped forward, and echoed back. And now I'm going in the other direction. It's very hard to describe what I'm doing in words. So hopefully seeing it in action makes it come clear. In my freehand quilting masterclass, I talk a lot about how freehand quilting is so much like handwriting, and this is a fantastic example of that principle. I mean, all these are is cursive L's or E's, really. And so it's one shape, and once you have graceful L's or E's, you can do an awful lot with them. Because my scale of this quilting, my spacing, is mm, 3 eighths to half inch, my kind of gauge for whether I should fit another loop in a little space or not has to do with that same scale. So I'm trying to not leave any unquilted gaps that are much bigger than a half an inch. Does that make sense? And if you were doing it on a bigger scale, you could also get away with larger spaces between things. You know, when you look at a corner and think, do I need to fit another loop in there or not? That all has to do with what the size of your quilting is. So whatever the spaces are in your quilted design, that's about how big the spaces can be in any unquilted area. That too really adds to the overall look of texture when you're finished. Unquilted areas tend to pop up because they're puffed up by the batting and so they will really catch the eye. So it's kind of important that you don't leave big old unquilted areas because they will be very visible. Almost better, you know, if it's one or the other, almost better to quilt too much in a little area than too little, because too much won't catch your eye as quickly as a big space will. Did you see how I'm just traveling to fill up this space? I thought I can't probably fit you know, going down there and all the way back. So I'm just gonna echo down and quilt back. And again, if my talking does not make sense, if I'm not describing it well in words, then just go by what I'm doing and don't worry about the talking at all. And I'm not pleased with that one. I find that that's an awkward shape, but I'm not gonna worry about it. One odd loop every so often. is just part of the freehandness. I often say we're after consistency, but not perfection. It is freehand. And you'll notice right there, I actually quilted over a line, gasp. And I think that that's okay. In this little corner, I'm just filling in as best I can so that I feel like the texture looks even and that is satisfactory. So that's one pass. I will undo all my clamps and magnets and things and you guys type in some questions if you have them and we'll chat for a minute.
So I've just left my needle down. I did not break thread. And I've unattached all my clamps and, and magnets. And I'm just going to go ahead and forward the quilt with the needle in it. And then I'll continue basting in that area um, where I am already. Now, I mentioned that Lucy has a 26 inch throat, which is very large. That's kind of quilting at arm's length for me. So when I advance, I don't usually advance all the way because that's quite a stretch to quilt. And also you guys can't see it as well when I'm up against that bar. So I've not made a huge advance. Okay, so I'm stepping back and I'm looking at my seam lines again because I've got this nice bar to be parallel to. So I'm just making sure, particularly at the ends, that they're not pulling downward this way or pulling upwards this way, that everything looks really nice and straight before I start basting. I also do little tugs here because I find that if I don't, Lucy's attached so you can't see well, if I go this way you can see better. If I don't tug the batting a little bit, it always tends to pull up in the middle. So if you don't know how much to do for that, like then just, you know, actually lift the quilt up like this. Make sure that your batting has no rumples in it. Make sure it's hanging down straight in front of you. And on you go. Mis Mr. Producer knows quite a bit about quilting these days and he's asking why no measuring tape. If you've watched other episodes, you've sometimes seen me use my giant um, measuring tape stretched across the front of the machine to make sure that it's perfectly square. Um, the simple answer is for economy of time. This is my own quilt. I'm fairly confident that it's fairly square. And because I'm using a channel lock to make a straight line down each side, I'm pretty confident that it will be within a quarter inch of perfectly square when it's done. And that ticks the box for me. Again, in other episodes, you've seen for various reasons when quilts are larger, when they have fussier quilting, when they have bias in them, I will put a measuring tape across the front and I will line up the edges of the quilt very carefully with each pass, but not this one. I'm all about saving time. Well, I'm not all about it, but it's a big factor. Let's put it that way. So any questions? No comments, you guys. Oh dear. Dave's saying that he, he, he's fessing up that he muted the mic well, in, it, it inadvertently. So, sorry about that. But you know, sometimes it's probably nice to be able to mute me. Let's be honest. Oh, my channel lock. So I just started my basting where I had left off from the first pass, continuing to make a straight line down. This linen is quite stretchy, so I can kind of manipulate it a little bit to make sure it's coming under the needle. And I just make sure my basting stays well within a quarter inch, and then you don't have to take it out, of course. It just falls within the binding of the quilt. Um, I didn't really realize, again, because you never watch other people quilting, there are quite a lot of quilters that don't base their edges. And I just gotta say, from my point of view, that is non-negotiable. I mean, I'm all about saving time, but I think that it costs a lot more time and um, doesn't look nearly as good if you don't baste. I always, no matter no matter what quilt, 100% of the time, I always baste those side edges with each advance. Um, the, the difference in results and the quality of results is remarkable. I don't think that's an area you wanna cut corners. You'll end up frustrating yourself because the quilt won't come square at the end and it's just not worth it. Okay, uh, I've got my stretchers on. I've got my magnets on. We're ready to quilt. Now, here's another thing. I was talking briefly about not wanting your L's to look like a stiff wind blew them all in one direction. One of the ways I avoid that I'm on this camera is by alternating my passes. So that first pass I started on my left and worked to my right. This pass, I'm gonna start at the right where I left off and work left. So that's just one more way that you can ensure that you're not all quilting in one direction, right? And because we're either right-handed or left-handed, we do have a tendency, you know, to make our L's, they're more comfortable going one way than the other. But alternating passes 
forces you to quilt things going in the other direction. So overall, it just helps with the look of the quilt. And Dave's saying there is a few comments, so I will just get my thread locked in place. And I will grab my coffee for a sip. Here we are. Okay, comments. Northern Sue, hello from Bancroft. Happy New Year's Eve, thank you. Same to you, Sue. Karen, Dave, I decided Susan was concentrating very hard when there was no talking through. Yeah, D Dave's just letting me see the conversation, which is nice. Nell, Happy New Year from North Carolina. Same to you, Nell. And Pat, I love the pattern of that quilt. Yes. So once again, I'll say it. It's called Home for the Holidays, and it's by Vanessa Christensen of V and Co. Um, oh, there you go. Dave says there's a link in the comments. It's been published for a couple years because I've been a couple years making this. But Wendy, I like this design and look forward to trying once I get home. Good, good, good. Let me know how it goes. Eileen, I'm with you on basting. Yeah, I, to me, that's just absolutely non-negotiable. Sherry, is it better to baste down rather than up or is there no difference? Um, I think, Sherry, that the reasoning behind basting upwards is so that you know where you want your stitching to be at the bottom and you are forced then to work in the excess. In my personal opinion, I'm managing that my seams are straight and that it's not either stretching or easing too much. That's a complicated answer, but basically I don't see a reason for it. The, the goal is to have it be straight and flat and lined up. And however you can achieve that, do it. So whether it means top to bottom, bottom to top, pinning every two inches, whatever it takes. You just want it to be even. The more excess or stuff there is, the more you might have to fiddle with that. But I don't think there's a there's a black or white on that. Marie, how much does a gamble like the one you're using cost? Oh, Marie, that's a, that's a big old question. Um, the one I'm using now costs a little more because I upgraded to a, um, I have a notebook on it, a tablet on it, and some digitized designs. But when I first got into it, I purchased a very used, more than 15 year old gamel that had very few bells and whistles. So it really, really varies. Demand right now is fairly high and they're a bit pricier than they used to be. Um, they probably start at three or 4,000 and they go north of there very quickly. <laughs> so it just really depends on what features you're looking for. If you're looking at a used one, it depends very much on the seller and how anxious they are to get rid of it too. So there are some good online sites like Longarm University. There are some groups on Facebook where people can advertise and talk about used machines and look for used machines. So I advise sort of haunting those places and keeping an eye out for a deal. That's, that's what I did when I started. Tara, how many loops in the max that you're doing in any pass? Probably six, Tara, and not because I think it would wreck the design, but because that usually just fills in, you know, the curl that I'm going over. But I don't think there's a wrong or a right answer there. Northern Sue, I just want to tell you how much I'm enjoying the podcast. I listen on my laptop, so no chance to like, etc. But I've enjoyed everyone and I'm not caught up yet. Oh, I'm so glad, Sue. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. It is a really fun opportunity to meet and talk with other crafters that I might not otherwise know. So, okay, we are all set for quilting. Let's get going. And maybe if you guys want to chime in, you can. This is a bigger quilt than what I sometimes do on these episodes. So it's apt to go longish, which is partly why I preloaded it. Um, you guys chime in. And I guess if you've got to do something else, you can. But also, like I said, this is not really a class. So if you want to be working on other things, baking, laundry, whatever, and just have this going in the background, I'm totally good with that. But if you guys are game, I'll probably just keep going till the quilt is done. My loops are sometimes longer or shorter depending on the space I'm trying to fill too. Again, I think it's more critical to be considering the spacing of my lines, you know, my, my three eighths of an inch, than it is whether the loop is long or short. The long or short won't catch the eye, but the giant um, spacing or not will catch the eye. Does that make sense?
you can see on this tree as I'm going over it, how um, varied the olive green is. But it's all one piece of fabric. Mm, now I'm, now I'm kind of second guessing myself. Those top two might be a different green, but it's at most two different fabrics making all the shades of green um, in that tree. I just love Vanessa's ombres. I've used the solids. I've used the blossom one. I can't think what it's called just now. And this confetti one that has the gold polka dots. They're all wonderful. There was one with a lot of loops. I mentioned earlier that there are quite bulky seam allowances in this quilt. And that's another thing I try on purpose to do when I'm freehanding is to quilt over or very close to those seams. Again, the areas that are not quilted are the ones that puff up and catch your eye. And they catch your eye because they catch the light because they're, they're popping upwards. So if you're wanting to camouflage a bulky seam, don't go around it to avoid it, but quilt right over it. It will look much better in the finished quilt. And I know quilters have differing opinions about that. But that's my opinion, and, and I've told you why, so hopefully that does make sense. But I encourage you, try it out for yourself, by all means. Do a quilt on which you quilt around the bulky parts, and then do one where you quilt over the bulky parts, or very close to, like an eighth of an inch. And in my opinion, making them lay down flat is much the better option. So that's the beauty of freehanding, is you can manipulate a little bit where your stitching falls in order to make that happen. For those of you that are new here, I have another resource that you might enjoy. It is a recorded, um, it was originally a webinar, but I recorded it and in it I was quilting an all over feather. So it's a real, much more than this is, it's a deep dive into that particular design and breaking down the individual elements and first learning to draw them and then learning to quilt them. And in that class, I demo that all over feather right from the individual little feather plumes um, through learning how to make them turn corners and bend gracefully learning how to fill in awkward bits in your quilt and even um, customizing little details to kind of make it your own so that class is always available and it is free but you do have to register and um, the easiest way is just by going to my website stitchedbysusan.com and it will pop right up a little registration form for it and then you can access it as often as you like. So feathers are your thing and, and feathers maybe seem intimidating and they do to a lot of quilters. I encourage you to give that a try. Feathers are one of my favorite things and I think you'll see that in the class. I absolutely love them. And there are a couple of these live and unscripted episodes um, that are that same design. So you can also um, go and watch it being done on a whole quilt. Did you see there I had kind of a small area, but it was about an inch and I thought, well, I can't leave that unquilted, that will show. And so I just did a simple little echo to sort of fill it up. 
And again, I know I've said it often, but it bears repeating. Um, what exactly I was quilting there will not be so obvious as how close it is and the texture that I created. Try and get back into this little area right here. Put one loop in there. Now I'll show you another one. I've worked myself, I don't know if you can see, but the front of my machine is right here. I'm not going to be able to echo back and do another filament to get out. So I'm gonna leave this one unechoed. And with luck, I'll see it when I come back on the next pass and I'll just fit in an echo then. Um, Dave saying, stick a pin in it. You know, it's really not worth that. But anyway, my point being, um, I can fill it in the next time. Or if I forget, it's not the end of the world. It's not going to catch the eye because remember, even quilting. I'll just space whatever's next to it similarly. And right over that seam. So I know it sounds a little disjointed and that's because this is not an organized class with an outline. But I hope that just me talking through these little things as I come to them helps you do the same in your quilting. I'm just trying to allow you a little peek into how my mind is working as I'm doing this in the hopes that that will help you with those same little conundrums. Here's another example. Um, I think this shows in the front. I've got this little area in front of my needle where I have to decide, am I gonna fit in another loop there or am I gonna echo back around? But picture if I went ahead and echoed, what a narrow space that would leave that I have to try and fill later. So I'm going to put another loop in just for that reason. It's gonna be shorter because a whole one didn't really fit. Does that make sense? That's part of my thinking when I'm trying to reason through you know, what will fit in here and I don't want to leave a space bigger than, you know, say half an inch. That's kind of how I reason it through. Here again, and I'm just going to go ahead and put a little one in there so that I don't have that awkward corner to try and fill on my next pass. Easier to do it now. And Tara, who was asking how many can you do, that was an example of how few. I do single ones quite often to tuck in the little corners. So that's also an option when you have a small little space. Just tuck in a single loop. I'm just gonna hold that seam down. I can see that it's really bulky. If you've never made a quilt with linen, I really encourage you to try it. Um, it's not pure linen. The Essex linen line is, I think, 55% linen, 45% cotton, and that's what this is. It has a different feel than cotton. It's a bit kind of softer. It has texture for sure. And it's just got this lovely, um, I mean, they're all woven. The cottons are too, but you have this woven look because there's the warp and the weft are a bit different colors, at least in this example. And I just love the look of it and I love the feel of it when it gets washed a few times. It just is so textural and lovely. 
Um, as I mentioned early on, it does fray um, quite badly. So be aware of that and be prepared for it. But it's not difficult to sew by any means. Again, just filling in a little echoing in those areas that are really too small to fit in a loop, but much too large to leave unquilted. Echoing in my chosen spacing fits the bill. And there's another thick seam. We're just gonna quilt into submission. Another. And those little pauses are just me taking a, a brief second to evaluate where do I want to go next? What do I need to fill next? Nothing wrong with pausing. I've even gone so far when I'm working on newer designs of literally stopping my machine, getting out my plexiglass um, audition sheet and laying it where I'm quilting and mapping out. What happens if I go this way next? All right, what happens if I go this way next? You know, and try to determine what's the most efficient way to go. And you get a feel for it. And I do recommend when you're trying out a design that's new to you, like do it on a whole project or two or three in quick succession and i'm sure that has to do with muscle memory it just your mind just starts to see the traveling paths and where to go next and how this is all working together and if you only do a little bit of it it will still feel difficult if you do a whole bunch of it it will come much more easily there's my unscientific explanation of that I don't know why it works, I just know that it does. And here I'm going to remain in the basting line. I did not echo that one, but I, I know that I can't echo it and do another one. So I've just left my needle down and I'm gonna go ahead and advance. And if you have any comments, this is the moment. Let me just advance the machine for a second and then I'll come back into camera view and we'll talk a little bit. All right. Okay, I'm ready for comments. I'm ready for a sip of coffee too. Um, I'm not seeing the camera view, Dave, I'm seeing screen there we go sometimes I don't know what's showing on the camera I'm just guessing flying blind <laughs> Karen I made Christmas stockings for the family this year 12 12 and used ombre fabric in most of them each stocking was can you put it back up Dave please 
each stocking was different patterns and free motion quilting on my sewing machine. Must say I was very proud of myself. And so you should be. Well done. Oh, there's David. <laughs> yeah, he mastered operating the remote. Northern Sue, do you ever baste across the bottom of your quilting surface? I've just been pinning in part to remind me of where my area ends. I certainly do in some applications. Usually it has to do with custom quilting. If I'm quilting different areas in my quilt and I need more security, if you will, sometimes I baste across the bottom. But for edge to edge work, the magnets do just fine. Eileen, I'm not a coffee drinker, but I love seeing your different mugs. I'm a mug collector. I love this one. It was given me by a friend. You are a blessing and inside. Uh, oh gosh, I have to have my glasses to read it. Just a second. Your love has given me much joy and comfort. Philemon 17, a nice little verse. Yes, I do love a good mug. Judy, I would like to see you do a t-shirt quilt on one of your lives. Your work is amazing. Here's the thing, Judy. My lives are constrained by either quilts that I sew or quilts that come from clients. And I haven't had a t-shirt quilt in a while. But I'll keep that in mind if one comes up. Lauren, love your backing fabric. Good. I second guessed it as one sometimes does, but I, I didn't have time to go shopping. So it was going to be something out of my stash. And I had a friend here yesterday and that's what she chose. So Eileen, just got my red edge snappers after watching you use them. Good. Let me know how they work for you and be assured that they do get easier with use. They limber up a little bit. So I think you'll love them. Dave's just hunting for another comment here. Oh, while he looks, I guess I'll baste a minute. Oh, found it, found it. Monica, happy new year. I tuned in late and not sure if you've already answered this, but what type of noise canceling headphones did you buy and why? Mr. Producer, would you know what my noise canceling headphones are? I will tell you this, Monica, they're not overly pricey ones. They are just insulated i think if you google noise canceling headphones i did not spend a fortune on them they're pretty simple um i was mentioning them i was mentioning them i think just in an instagram post i do love to listen to podcasts and audible books but of course the noise of the machine can get very wearing especially if you're quilting for hours so i do like my puffy headphones that cancel out some of the machine noise that's where that came from Oh, and there's a question about the master class. Let's have it. Shield, can you tell a bit about your master class? Sure, I'll tell a little bit. It's a um, pre-recorded class, and there are six modules in it, and I think there's over 40 lessons at the last count. It's all about freehand quilting and mostly about this style of edge-to-edge -edge quilting. So each module, I talk some first about what I call theory. So reasons for why I do things, what some of the goals are with your quilting. Like today I talked about, you know, traveling and transitions and echoing. So talking about some of those mechanics that make up a good freehand design. And then each module has a series of designs that I quilt out for you on my long arm, on camera, talking through every little step as I go. Here's where you go next. Here's how you plan it. Here's problems you're gonna encounter. So there's, uh, be, there's about 35 designs um, in the master class. And then in the later modules, I go into how this um, helps you develop your skill for more high-end custom quilting. How you, know, you can have learned, for example, with a design like this one, you're working on L's and E's, and how that motion makes your quilting become very precise. And if you, when you're doing this type of daily work, if you're working on making smooth, even, graceful shapes, then when you go into custom quilting, you already have the skills in hand. So doing this type of work is a great way to build your skills. You don't have to make custom, you know, do custom quilts to learn custom quilting high-end skills. So that's a brief look um, at the masterclass. It's going to be offered again um, late February, early March. So I run it in sessions so that I can kind of be engaged with the students as they work through. And we have a private Facebook group. And so there's, you know, talk and discussion and questions about that. So I try and be quite involved every time I have a group of students going through. So I run it three or four times a year. Um, if you're on my newsletter, you will receive notification of when that um, happens. Um, also on my on my website, um, 
there's a page for the master class and there's a wait list there you're welcome to sign up for that as well and then you'll be sure to have notification when it's next available yeah thanks for your interest and this these sessions honestly are like a it's kind of extracurricular you know a lot of the designs that I do quilt in these sessions um, perhaps are in that class I just don't teach them in these live and unscripted sessions like I teach them in the class and I have just run out of bobbin thread ladies how convenient was that when I was basting seriously look at this empty bobbin bobbin chicken I won I'm just running out of camera to get another bobbin which I already have filled and I'll add here I do fill my own bobbins they're the same um, weight and type of thread as I have on the top the isocord 40 weight as I mentioned earlier um, I, the quilting on the top thread is a charcoal gray that really matches well with the linen that my background is but on the bottom I chose a shade lighter gray so it didn't contrast quite so highly with the pinks and reds but because they're similar it still works well Okay, left side is basted and ready to go. For those who may just be chiming in, these episodes are irregular. The first and third Friday of every month, I do a live and unscripted episode. They are always in real time. I call them my quilting reality show. And so whatever the project is, you get to see it happening in real time. You get to see when I have thread breaks or oopses. And my whole point is to just show you what quilting looks like in my studio and help you, you know, deal with these things when you encounter them in your own. So yes, first Monday and Friday of every month. Today, as you know, is the fifth Friday. It's kind of a bonus episode today, but we'll be back again next week with another. I don't yet know what the project is, so I can't tell you that. Um, if you're interested in supporting these episodes, they are free, but I do have a buymeacoffee.com forward slash stitched by Susan site where if you wish, you can make a contribution as small as $5. If you would like, you can sign up for what I call my coffee and cream membership, and it's um, just a regular $5 a month donation that is how we are consistently upgrading our cameras our cords I might even have a picture for you next Friday um, the last thing that we purchased was actually for Dave so you guys don't see it directly but up until a couple of weeks ago he literally unplugged all this equipment from his office carried it all down the hall to my studio and replugged it all back in well we purchased him a table that has all the USB plug-ins and it has wheels to roll so now he just has to unplug a couple of things and wheel the whole thing down to my studio and it's really really nice so that's what buy me a coffee does many of you have been really generous there and i sure do appreciate it Had to stop and think, now which direction is it going to travel if I loop this way, and which direction will it travel if I loop that way? The very first project I did this on was a table runner, so not terribly large. Um, I've seen similar filament designs done with um, pantographs. 
So then it's kind of pre-mapped out for you, right? Where to go next. And I thought, I think, I think I can do that freehand. So I tried it on a table runner first to make sure that it was gonna be doable. And it was. Now, if I stop here, are we on the close-up camera? Yes. If I stop here, I'm gonna have this, an echo back. I'm gonna have this kind of funny, awkward bit there. So I'm actually gonna go ahead and echo over there and make some loops and some echoes to fill that up. And then I'm just gonna keep echoing that first filament that I did. Just to illustrate for you that it is not about forming filaments perfectly. It is literally much more about forming evenness of texture. No one will ever be any the wiser that I did that. And every so often I cross over an earlier stitching line too, you know, where a loop was. Yeah, no one's ever going to see that. As long as I keep my texture even to the eye. It's all good. And here again, a really bulky seam. So I'm actually gonna keep my finger on that. I'm gonna go really slowly. I wanna make sure that it doesn't push out in front of my hopper foot and I wanna be sure that it gets stitched in place. So now that you've seen me quilting for a while, maybe you, this will make more sense. I'm echoing to be ahead, like in the direction I want to go. I'm looping back. And then I'm echoing in the direction I want to go, in general. So does that make sense? So now I'm changing directions. So I just went right into the loops. I'm still looping back, because that's now my backwards where I'm coming from, and I'm echoing ahead. Echoing ahead, looping back. Had to stop and think there. Which way does my loop go? Looping back, echoing ahead. Echoing ahead, looping back. So that's my rule of thumb. You've seen quite a few exceptions to the rule, but that's my general rule of movement. And I'm gonna go right into this small area up here. Here again, just a few little echoes to fill that in. Big seam. Pull on that a little bit. I don't want it to get pushed at a funny angle from my hopper foot. at the limit of where Lucy can reach. I don't know if you could see that, but I could feel I was right at the edge. Pushing it a little too far.
and I looped backwards. But you know what? There's no wrong way. We'll just fill it in. Echo back over to where I wish I had gone. And keep going. If I didn't say these things with any luck, you wouldn't even notice that I had gone the wrong way. But, trying to be transparent here. And show you just those little recoveries. way. Seriously, this is very much like ribbon candy. Every so often I just, I almost feel like I'm dizzy. I'm like, oh, which direction do I go next? Yeah, got more echoing in there than I would usually do, but again, because it's evenly spaced, it looks totally fine. You can probably see as I'm working that so many of my loops, because I'm traveling toward my right, so many of my loops are angling toward the right. So that's why it's critical, I feel, to alternate your past directions. That will not be noticeable if, I think, if on my next pass, most of my loops angle left. That will very much mitigate that, you know, um, stiff wind sort of look. So I think that's critical for a freehand quilter is to be able to quilt in both directions. And also, I talked about, you know, in the master class, one of the points that I really make is how these skills are, um, or this type of everyday quilting is what creates your skill level for custom quilting. One of the things that I encourage is quilting any given design in every direction, not only left and right, but up and down because that is a critical skill for being able to do, you know, consistent bubbles or consistent loops or consistent ribbon candy. You must be able to do it in every direction. But that's the beauty of this is you get a chance to practice with no pressure because it doesn't matter if they're perfect in every direction, but you're still creating that skill.
I don't think I can do another one, so I'm just going to echo back. Decisions, decisions. Freehand quilting gives you lots of decisions to make as you're quilting on the fly, but it also gives you so much freedom. I'm almost to the end of this pass. I would love to hear your personal reactions to was an edge-to-edge -edge design the right choice for this quilt? Or should I have taken the time to custom quilt it? And as always, um, in a day or two after I get some good lighting on it, I'll take some good photographs of the whole quilt so you'll be able to see um, kind of the full effect as well. And then too, I'd love if you'd chime in on your thoughts about that. I'm fully convinced in my mind, but you know, maybe it's just me, but I almost always opt for the texture now over the heavily detailed quilting. I just often think the detailed quilting almost is a distraction from the beauty of the quilt, where this type of texture just allows the quilt, the beautiful colors or the beautiful piecing or the beautiful stars, whatever they may be, to shine. Now you're wa watching me work my way back into an awkward corner here because I did leave a piece unquilted. So I've just left one unechoed and I'm just gonna keep working my way back till I get that corner filled in. And when I next come around, I'll finish up the echoes on that one group of little filaments. Right here, I'll just keep on echoing right around those little filaments. And we're at the edge. Okay. Just popping my magnets off. And by the way, I'll put in a little, a little piece of advice here too. When I do um, repetitive quilting like this one is, I find my hands go to sleep. So I don't know if that happens to you or not. Maybe it's how I grip my handlebars. However, here's my little trick. I think it's wise to stop at least with every pass and do something a little bit physical you know, give your arms a couple swings at the most, or at the least. Uh, do some rotations of your wrist, shake your legs a little bit, that sort of thing. Get blood flow going again, because it's all too easy for me anyways to kind of be head down quilting and not thinking and just being so stationary or gripping, as you saw, the handlebars. And um, it's good for the body to make the blood flow again. Okay, any comments while I fiddle with this? Northern Sioux, do you have a preferred brand weight of thread that you use most often? Yes, I particularly love the Isocord 100% Poly thread. It is a 40 weight. To me, it feels more like a 50. It's, it's, it satisfies me with the fineness of it. What it does have is a little bit of sheen because it is polyester, so not everybody loves it for that reason. Um, cotton would have less sheen. On the flip side, cotton has more lint. So I choose this one because I do so much volume of stitching. I like the low lint of the poly thread and it's strong. So you can go high speeds and it's all good with that. Karen, when you first started your loops, I thought, ah, this is easy. Well, I've changed my mind is moving your loops from left to right to sideways is very difficult. 
It does mess with your head a bit. It does take a little bit of practice. I'm agreeing. But you'll get it. Northern Sue, could you please publish a book with all your designs, when to use them, tips and tricks, etc.? Now, when would I be doing that? <laughs> but I hear you. Shield, I would love a book. Oh, you guys. It would be so fun, but the logistics of that are quite, quite enormous. Karen. No, Susan, you did make the right choice. This makes me think of globes, falling leaves, flowers. It's delicate for the geometric designs. Yeah, good. I'm glad, I'm glad you agree with me. Teresa, I agree. E to E complements the piecing and makes for a softer feel to the quilt. I prefer custom for wall hangings. Yes, where it's all, a, it's all about the visual, right? And the detail. You're standing there looking at the detail. Lauren, I'm sitting here trying to guess which way you're going to go next. Most of the time I'm wrong. But I turned my laptop upside down and that helped to see the actual direction you're quilting. Makes sense. That is one of the difficulties of filming is I can't film from where I am because my arms and hands are in the way. <laughs> there we go. Dave's asking if it's easier if I stand on my head. Um, yeah, that's just one of the difficulties of filming. But I've had other people say that too, that sometimes it just literally helps to turn the screen so that you're looking at it the same way I'm looking at it. Karen, Lauren, that is what I've been trying to do. Must turn my iPad. Yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> Any more? Okay. Still. Oh, Eileen, there we go. Sorry about that. I like the overall texture for most quilts. It doesn't take away from the piecing. There's definitely a time and place for both, but this quilt, the graphics of the piecing are the star. And you're right, Eileen, there, there is a place absolutely for custom quilts, but most of the time I gravitate toward this kind of texture. Lauren, as someone who took her master class, I highly recommend it. I learned so much. Thank you, Lauren, for that vote of confidence. Eileen, the master class is the bomb. You won't be disappointed. Aw, you guys are too sweet, honestly. And Shield, thanks so much. I love your personality and techniques. Good, I appreciate that. It's very informal, as you see. This is just welcoming you into my world. So, I am what you see. So let's keep quilting. I don't think I put my channel lock on. Hang on a sec, ladies. There we go. Someone did ask the other day how I got confident with my fingers in front of the hopper foot, and I didn't have a good answer for her. So you do what feels best for you. I'm very conscious, you know, like I am when I'm chopping an onion, of keeping my fingers on the fabric. Like I don't ever, ever, ever lift them. So I feel like I'm okay at that point. The hopper foot is quite thick. It's not gonna go over my finger. The only way the needle would catch me is if I had a finger waving about in the air. But if that does not feel comfortable to you, then by all means, don't do it. Um, hopefully by the next time that I see you, I will have hit the thousand quilt mark. And I say that only to say, like I have spent a lot of time handling my machine, right? So I do feel pretty comfortable um, knowing exactly what it's going to do, what it's capable of, and how to stay out of its way, if that makes sense. So there's a conversation starter. Any ideas for how I should celebrate a thousand quilts? And I mentioned earlier that my current machine does have digital capability. Um, I've done less than 15 quilts with the digital designs on it. So those thousand um, at least 985 are hand done, just like this one. Some larger, some smaller. But that is a thousand freehand quilts. So, I need a good way to celebrate. And I'm open to um, giveaway ideas, quite frankly. What would be a fun giveaway? So I'm um, not sure you can't see this on camera. I'm struggling off to the side, putting my little red snapper clips on because I'm at the seam of my backing and it's quite difficult to get that seam to fit in the little channel. So forgive me while I mess with that a little bit. Um, you don't have a camera at this end? Okay, I'm gonna show you guys a tip at the other end. Something that happens when you have, um, gosh, we can't see it very well. Just since this is coming up, Dave's going to move the camera a little bit so that I can show you. It's going to be wobbly for a sec, so just bear with us for half a second here. 
And just stay with it if you would, Dave, because it'll just be a minute and then we can put it back. That'll be fine. When backing is quite a bit wider than the quilt, and on the other end it's even more than this, when you start rolling the quilt up, because there's no batting on this edge, it, it starts getting saggy, saggier and saggier the more you advance your quilt. So if there's enough of it, you can literally take a pleat and tuck it up in under the roll, or what I often do, and I hope you can see this, is I pull on that piece of fabric. We're trying, <laughs> this is hilarious. Dave's just gonna hold it. I just pull on it and see how that pulls my backing tighter, otherwise it wants to sag like this. I literally just pull on it and insert a pin in there. Now the trick is, of course, you have to remember to pull those pins out as you're unrolling your quilt because it's going right through to the leader, but that takes up all that sag. Sag is never a good thing, never. So while Dave is adjusting the cameras, I'm just putting my um, magnetic bars back on. Nothing too exciting going on over here. And some machines have different devices for these, which you might have. I know Gamel makes a kind of some C-shaped clamps that you can just clamp right over the bar. Great, but these are very inexpensive. And if your machine has metal rails, they work very, very well. Okay, more questions, comments? Northern Sioux, thousand quilts, a book. I don't have pictures of a thousand quilts. Like probably, I was probably 500 in before I started getting fairly diligent about taking pictures. Lauren, Dave needs to take you out for dinner and dancing to celebrate. Check. <laughs> okay. But I was more thinking of ways to celebrate with, with students and watchers. Okay guys, which way did I end? Right, left, right, yep. This design is kind of hard to tell, quite honestly. Because remember, I'm alternating directions of my passes. So the last one I quilted from my right to my left, and now I'm quilting from my... I said that the wrong way around, but you know what I mean. This one I'm quilting from right to left. I'm gonna throw another topic into the mix just for cuz. This is not um, in the realm of a book, but I have been thinking of producing some YouTube shorts, which is just uh, much shorter videos with obviously smaller amounts of content. And so my thought is that they might contain things like favorite tools or simple um, techniques. So what made me think of it was starting my thread at the beginning of this pass. So the process of beginning a thread or of ending a thread or of splicing in the middle of a quilt, those types of things. So the conversation starter that I'm asking about is, would you guys consider either on my Facebook page, Stitched by Susan, or emailing me some of your ideas for what you'd like to see in those, and then I'll try to address those exact things. So I'm talking, you know, five minute topics, max, maybe even less than that. Mr. Producer is telling me that shorts are 90 seconds, but I was watching someone's the other day. Maybe it wasn't a short. They said it was a short, and it was a lot longer than 90 seconds. Anyway, the idea remaining the same, that it would be little snippets. But I would love to know what your questions are and try and answer those. Big seam. There we go.
I'm gonna go all the way down here because I think I can only get one more set in. And I went the wrong way. Did you see that? Okay, I'm pausing for a second. I'm at the limits of what Lucy can quilt there, so I'm just gonna roll her ahead a quarter inch just so I can get my echo and get back out of there. Ha, huh, another little hack you might not have known. When all else fails, it's like letting the tires out of, or sorry, letting the air out of um, the tires of a piece of heavy equipment to get under a bridge, right? Same idea. Just roll your long arm forward a quarter inch to get around the awkward corner. And if that's a story you never heard, maybe it's only me, but that used to be one that we got in school, it seemed like. You know, a guy is hauling a heavy piece of equipment uh, loaded onto a, an 18-wheeler, and he goes to travel under a bridge and find he can't fit. What does he do? Of course, you know the answer, because I already said it. He lets a half an inch of air out of the tires. So there's always a little solution. There's me pausing again. Which way am I gonna go next? <laughs> and was it Lauren that was saying you're trying to predict which way I go and you're not very often hitting it? The truth of the matter is there's not really a right way, right? You can make either way work. I was just trying to explain to you my thought processes for why I do it a certain way. But honestly, if organizing it differently works for you, be my guest, organize it differently. And the next pass, by the way, will be the last one. So the end is in sight.
going the wrong direction, ladies. But I'm going to fudge it, and I'm just going to continue on doing loops to fill up the top end. And then echo my way back. Never um, underestimate the power of fudging. I love these little olive green trees. And there I had two rows that were quite close together. So yeah, I just echoed my way back out. Again, focusing on getting pretty even spacing. Between my lines of quilting, that's all that really matters. back up to that top area. There we go. 
I'm just using my basting line as a means for travel, basically. I try not to quilt way, way off the edge because I don't want to cut my quilting threads when I trim up the edge of my quilt. So I try to make my pattern, you know, look like it, well, stop. So I try to visualize the whole loop or design or whatever, but still stop where that basting is rather than stitching the loop way out in the edge. You certainly could, but then that thread is gonna get cut when you trim up your quilt, right? So that's why I personally avoid it. Okay, I think this is our last pass. So it'll be your last chance to fire off some good questions at me. We'll get an opportunity to see how square, uh-oh. Do you guys see what I see? <laughs> we did say this is live and unscripted, didn't we? So we have a dilemma. Let me move Lucy here. And this is a dilemma I probably cannot fix on camera. There's Lucy gone. All right. See this edge right here? I'll show you if I fold the batting back, what happens? My backing runs out before my quilt runs out. So um, this is not a thing I'm going to be able to fix on camera, but I'll talk about it on camera so you can have some idea of what I'm gonna do and I'll post pictures after the fact so that you can then know what I did in case I changed my mind. Um, there are a couple of options. I'm sure what went wrong was my fault. I did lay them out on the floor to make sure it was large enough beforehand, but sometimes just in the process of getting the camera set up and getting the things preloaded and whatever, I maybe used up a little more excess than I should have at the top. So my, my backing is, I mean, some of it is under the red snapper. It's about an inch shorter than my actual quilt. So there are a couple choices which would depend on your quilt. One would be make the quilt a little bit shorter if that didn't conflict with the piecing. But of course it does in my stars, so I'm not gonna choose that option. Another option would be if there is enough, but it's just under the snapper, and I will check for that, then I'll unload the thing and I'll sew like a leader onto my backing so that that's what loads under the snapper and I can use every tiny fraction of an inch of my backing. Otherwise, I'm gonna have to add a piece of fabric onto the backing of my quilt. Um, an option, likewise, if it was another quilt, would be I have lots on the sides here, right? You could take a piece off there and put a piece on here, but this is very directional, so that's probably not gonna work here either. So you're seeing me literally process this problem <laughs> before your very eyes. The first thing I'm gonna do is unload this end and see if there is enough backing that I could eke it out if so, I'm going to sew a leader onto the end and just go ahead and finish my quilt that way. If there's not enough, I may take a piece from the other end because I know that I have at least two or three inches up there and that's going to be enough. So it's, it's going to probably be one or two of those things, but either way, I'm going to have to unload my quilt in order to do that. So I guess that concludes it for today. Let me know if you have any questions. Don't be laughing too hard at me, okay? I'm going to get my coffee. <laughs> yeah, let's do it in the main camera if we could. And let's see if I've missed talking about anything. My glasses are glaring, so let's just take them off. Um, I mentioned the master class, which is a um, comprehensive freehand quilting class that I offer. You can find lots more information on it. I won't talk about it at length here, but on my website, there's a master class page. There's lots of details about it, what's in each module and what you can expect. Um, the wait list is open and it's not too many weeks till the next round uh, launches this spring. Joey, late to the party again. I'm delighted that you're doing your new design. Well, if you just arrived, Joey, you've seen me um, eating humble pie, not to put it too mildly, or maybe drinking it out of a cup um, because I ran out of backing on the edge of my quilt. And you know, even a thousand quilts in, stuff like this happens. Like when I get out of my routine of how I check my quilt and how I measure and whatever, because I'm taping today, it's all too easy for stuff like this to happen. However, I'm going to deal, and it'll be a fine quilt when it's all done. Lauren, I can't believe you haven't run out of bobbin thread again. It's due to happen any minute, I would say. Yeah, Dave, she loves playing bobbin chicken. It's true. I, I win quite frequently at bobbin chicken. It's pretty funny. Fran, I was late getting here also. Love all your ideas. May have to try this on one of the nine baby quilts I'm quilting. 
Baby quilts are a great way to try out new quilting designs. You get to see if you like them or have a feel for them. I did say earlier with this particular design, you're just changing directions so much. It can be a little challenging to get the hang of. So I encourage you, do it on more than one project. Quilt it for a while and see if those, you know, neural pathways don't start to make the connection. Um, I tend to do that when I'm learning a new design or developing a new one. I use it repetitively a few times, kind of work out the kinks, kind of get the muscle memory established, and then it goes much easier. Karen, not enough backing. Oh, no. Yeah. My little granddaughter does not have a lot of words in her vocabulary, but uh-oh is one of them. <laughs> uh-oh. <laughs> Lauren's laughing. I know. It's it's. Oh, she's crying. Oh, sorry. See, I couldn't see that. Eileen, we've all been there, done that. I know we have. And it'll not be the last time for me, I'm sure. I'll figure it out. And I'll post pictures of the finished quilt. Joey, not laughing at all. My heart sunk in my chest. I'm about ready to cry. Oh, don't cry. It, it's, it's a matter of a little bit of time, maybe half an hour of time, but it is not the end of the world. Fran, definitely not laughing. So sorry it happens. Thank you for how to fix it. And see, it was an opportunity, and I'll treat it as that. It doesn't happen very often, so it's not a thing you see too often on this show. But I talked you through a couple of the options for fixing it. I know there are ladies who actually add that seam on their long arm. I think it probably could be done. Um, but because I'm trying to scavenge out every little tiny piece, I don't think I'll do it that way. I'm going to actually unload. And I'm sorry I talked too long. I lost that last comment, Dave. Oh, Northern Sue, can you not add another piece without removing from the frame? Not sure of the process. You could, but you kind of have to have the tension on it, right, Sue? So I would lose what's under my red snapper still. So if I was missing six inches and I needed to add a big chunk, that might work. Um, but I'm not going to attempt it, frankly. I'm just going to take it off and take it to my sewing machine. My, I, do, I doubt that you can see this on camera, but I have zippered leaders, so I actually can zip it off fairly easily. So at the top end, I won't have to undo everything. I'll only have to undo the bottom end. And it's not that big a quilt. It's not that big a deal. By the time you guys see pictures, it'll all be fixed. And I promise I'll even post pictures of the fix so you can actually see how it looks. So... <laughs> Might be the first YouTube short, Dave is saying. <laughs> Pretty funny. Anyway, all of that aside, thank you so much for joining me. Once again, these live and unscripted episodes are regularly on the first and third Friday of every month. So next Friday, I will be back already with another project. And they're always casual. And whatever happens, like today, happens. And I just talk you through the processes of how quilts get done in my studio. So thanks ever so much for joining me. I'm Susan Smith. And I will see you next time.